This will be our introduction to astronomical history. In this video we'll look at Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Galileo. And that's who these are left to right in here. We actually have no idea what Ptolemy looked like. He's the figure on the left. That drawing of him was made sometime in the 14 or 1500s, I think. I'm not positive just when. And he died in about 150 AD, so uh, don't trust that one a bit. The other two drawings, though, the middle one is a figure of Copernicus that was made when he took an art class as a teenager, and it's a self-portrait. And so, not too bad. I couldn't draw anything worth that. And uh, over on the right is Galileo. That was a sketch done by a professional artist, so we have a pretty good idea what he looked like. I'm going to start this with looking at the motion of Mars against the background stars. Uh, 2003 was quite a while ago. Some of you may not have even been born then. But in 2003, Mars happened to have a closest approach to Earth. And turns out this was the nearest that Earth and Mars had been in about the last 60,000 years or something like that. It has a close approach, oh, a little over every two years, about every two years and two months. But this one was supposedly special, although it turns out it wasn't all that much closer than it is on average in a close approach. There was a, a press conference with a NASA scientist, and the scientist stated in the press conference that through a telescope at 75 power, Mars would look bigger than the full moon does to the naked eye. Now, most of the reporters at the conference got things right, and they wrote about that. But one of them, either intentionally or because he wasn't paying close attention, forgot about the through the telescope at 75 power bit and wrote that at closest approach, Mars would look larger than the full moon does. And that wasn't quite what they said. It wasn't at all what they said, but... Pretty soon you start hearing about all this stuff out on the internet about how there were going to be these giant tides and earthquakes and all sorts of horrible things that were going to happen because Mars was going to be so close to the Earth. And it wasn't all that close to the Earth. Anyway, um, this is a series of drawings. Actually, I used astronomy software to do this, but showing where the position of Mars would be against the background stars during this period when it had the closest approach. And I think the first figure that you see on here, here you can see Mars right here. It's against the background stars of Capricornus. Neptune was also in that part of the sky. I think Neptune was right up about here. And Uranus was over here. Actually, the planet is just above the left part of the U of Uranus there. And so, those three were in there. However, Mars is the one that would be easily visible to the naked eye. Neptune you cannot see with the naked eye, but a pair of binoculars makes it easy. And then Uranus, if you're under dark enough skies, you can see it with the naked eye. I have seen that before. But anyway, about May 10th of 2003, that's where Mars was against the stars of Capricornus. About two weeks later, Mars had moved to this position. And when we're looking up at the sky like this, we're looking south, to the right is west, and to the left is east, so Mars has moved east against the background stars. In a single night, you would not notice anything. Mars would rise in the east with the stars of Capricornus, move all the way across the sky, pretty much staying in exactly the same position, unless you're looking through a telescope at a pretty high magnification, you wouldn't know it had changed at all against the background stars during that time that it was above the horizon. But if you come back two weeks later and look at it, yes, it will have appeared to move against the background stars. About two weeks later, Mars is even farther to the east. Two weeks after that, farther to the east, a bit farther to the east, 
Now it doesn't seem to be going as far in each two week stretch and so something's different. Whoa, it just changed direction. By the way, uh, this is the moon up here so ignore it. It's not part of this story. But Mars just reversed direction and now it is going from east to west. And it does that for a couple of weeks. There's the moon again. Now it's reverse direction again. Oh, so it looks like for a period of uh, oh, four or five weeks, something like that, instead of going from west to east, it's going from east to west. That reversal of the usual direction we refer to as retrograde motion. When the planet changes direction and goes from east to west instead of west to east. And now it continues on. There's a comet showing up down there in the lower right hand corner. Moving a little bit. But Mars is continuing on moving to the east now. That's the path traced out from the 10th of May until the 21st of November. This is on a star chart that I wanted you to print before you started watching this, but at least you can see what's going on here. And this was a mystery and something that people have been viewing and observing for thousands of years and trying to explain it. And the first people that did it, that wrote about it at least, were the ancient Greeks. And so let's have a look at them. This is that figure of Claudius Ptolemy. Again, we have no idea what he looked like, so don't try to pin that on him. Um, that appearance anyway. He lived from about 85 to 165 AD. Um, I think the most recent thing I looked at had uh, 170 for the year of his death, but not sure. He wrote a book that in English, if you spread it out, is uh, the greatest compilation or various things like that. It's usually called the Almagest, although we should probably just call it Almagest. Uh, Almagest in Arabic means the majestic, and so if we stick a the on the front of it, we're being a little redundant. He refined what's known as the geocentric model, and that is the old Earth-centered model of the ancient Greeks. People hundreds of years before Ptolemy had been working on this, people like Aristotle and Aristarchus, well, maybe not Aristarchus, but uh, some of the early Greek astronomers and mathematicians and things, and they'd done quite a bit with this, but Ptolemy applied a lot of mathematics to it, uh, refined it quite a bit from what people had done before, and then uh, wrote about it considerably, and his work hung around. Ptolemy lived in Egypt, and the Ptolemy part of his name, although this is kind of an Englishized version of it, but the Ptolemy part was a Greek name. The Claudius was a Roman name. He did his writing in Greek, though, and so uh, we think of him as being a Greek astronomer. But when the Roman Empire fell, most of the copies of Ptolemy's book vanished with the collapse of that, although some of those copies did show up or were preserved by the Arabic astronomers. And they would translate it from Greek into Arabic, and they kept the book alive and continued to study from it. Then, in about the 12th century, Arabic copies of it managed to work their way back to Europe, and people translated it then from Arabic into Latin, typically until I think the 15th or 16th century some uh, copies in the original Greek were actually found and so then they started comparing versions. They'd all been copied by hand at that point and uh, found some math mistakes that people had made in the copying from one to the other. But uh, anyway, the book did survive and when it worked its way back into Europe it was considered the correct model of the universe. So it had the 
geocentric, the Earth-centered model. And here's what it looks like. It had the Earth at the center with the Moon orbiting the Earth and then everything else orbited the Earth, including the Sun over here. So the Sun orbits the Earth. Uh, Venus and Mercury orbited the Earth and they orbited in addition to having orbits around the Earth, they also had small circular orbits on those orbits that we refer to as epicycles. And their epicycles were centered on an Earth-Sun line. We never saw them very far away from the Sun. And so that was the reasoning in the Ptolemaic model was that that was going on. But the outer planets as well, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, also orbited the Earth, and their paths also had epicycles. Had all of that stuff going on. Fairly complicated in the model. So, again, geocentric, that just means Earth-centered. Geology is the study of the Earth, as is geography. Uh, the Sun had a circular orbit around the Earth. The planets had circular orbits with epicycles. And Venus and Mercury had those interesting orbits that um, were centered on the Earth, but their epicycles, the center of them, uh, was on that line between the Sun and the Earth. Uh, before we get on to Copernicus, I want to show you an animation. This is a model of the, the Ptolemaic system and just showing the orbit of Venus to give you some idea of what it's like. And in this model, the Earth will be the blue dot right in the center here, right near that green cross. And Venus will be this red spot here. And there's a little key down here that it describes it. The large circle here, the one that is centered on the Earth, is referred to as the deferent. That's the thing that we've just called the orbit. And then this smaller circle is called the epicycle. And I don't know that these are the correct scale according to what Ptolemy would have predicted, but it'll give you an idea of what's going on here anyway. And so I'm going to slow this animation way down. That's maybe a little too slow. There's the path of Venus. The small backwards motion that we would refer to as retrograde motion is produced by the fact that at the same time Venus is traveling in a circular orbit around the Earth. It's also got this smaller circle that it's doing at the same time. And it's the combination of those two that'll give it retrograde motion. If you watch down along the zodiac strip on the bottom, you can see at most of the time that the planet P, that's marked there with the red spot, is moving from right to left. But every once in a while, should be happening soon again here. Takes a while on this one. Should be happening soon. Every once in a while, it reverses direction and goes from left to right, which is from east to west. And then it resumes its normal direction again. So that's how the retrograde motion was explained in the Ptolemaic model and by the ancient Greeks. Now on to Nicholas Copernicus. Copernicus lived a long time after Ptolemy. In fact, uh, let's see, he would have been born about 1300 years after Ptolemy. A canon of the Catholic Church, that's like an administrative position. So 
he would have been in charge of raising taxes and distributing charity to the poor in some region of what is now Poland. The book that he wrote, De Revolutionibus, is about the way you'd say that. There's actually several words in Latin tagged on to that, but nowadays it seems to just be called De Revolutionibus, which is nice because the other one's too long was published in 1543 and if you notice there's a couple of coincident dates there 1543 he died 1543 his book was published he may have seen a copy of it on maybe the last week of his life or so but he might not have been aware of its publication uh, he was suffering from either Alzheimer's or senile dementia the last few years of his life and at that point he just might not have been there. The Copernican model looks familiar. Heliocentric, that's just a word that means sun-centered. Helios was an old name for the sun. Uh, the planets had circular orbits. It had a simple explanation for retrograde motion another animation here now this is the copernican model i can set this thing so let's see we'll go with earth for the inner planet and pick mars for the outer planet so this is about the correct spacing of earth and mars and down below you can see where how the planet will appear against the background stars so Let's start the animation here. Something you can see is that the blue planet there, Earth, travels faster than the outer planet. And in the Copernican model, the closer a planet was to the Sun, the faster it happened to orbit. At times, Earth will be on the far side of the Sun from the planet, and we won't be able to see it. That's the case right now. No surprise there. I've got this going fairly slow, but pretty soon we're going to see Earth catch up to and pass Mars. And watch what happens down below on the zodiac strip when that happens. The planet stops, appears to move backwards for a while, and then moves forward again. That's the retrograde motion. And I'll speed it up so we see the next one quite a bit sooner. And then I'll slow it down again when Earth's about to catch up to Mars. That's maybe a little too much. But there's Earth catching up to and passing Mars. Mars looks like it's going backwards for a little while when that happens. That's an easy explanation. Mars never stops moving. It's continuing to orbit at the same rate. However, when the Earth catches up to and passes Mars, it looks like Mars is going backwards. That's the easy explanation for retrograde motion. And so, he's got it. Kepler had a first printing of his book. There was a second printing not too long afterwards. And... The book was widely disseminated, read carefully by many people, including Galileo Galilei, who's the next character here. Now, I'm not quite going through this historical stuff in time, but I'm looking at Galileo now because he was very much a, cha a champion of Copernicus and supported him very much, including all the different features of his model. Um, Born, what, about 21 years after Copernicus died. Lived a long life for that time, 1564 to 1642. A well-known, or son of a well-known lute player and a music theorist. Never married, but did have three children with his mistress. He had a son and two daughters. The daughters went into a convent at the time because they... Uh, didn't have or weren't considered legitimate they didn't have many choices except possibly going into a convent the older of the two daughters 
appears to have been Galileo's intellectual equal. We don't have the letters that he wrote to her, but we do have copies of the letters that she wrote to him, and it's apparent in the, from those letters that they were discussing his scientific work and his scientific theories back and forth between the two. When she died, she died in a cholera epidemic of cholera, all of her possessions were burned. So all those letters that her father wrote to her were burned and we have no idea what was in them. They'd be a real treasure if they hadn't been burned. But at any rate, he supported his daughter's convent for many years. He was the primary financial supporter of it. I'd always had the idea that uh, he must have just been um, a marginal Catholic at best, but he was a devout Catholic throughout his life. He just did have some difficulties with the Catholic Church, um, but it was mainly because he managed to offend the wrong person, the Pope, and uh, it's not good to get on the wrong side of the politics of the Pope when effectively the Catholic Church was the ruling authority in Italy where he lived. He was one of the world's first experimental scientists, and it's a little bit ironic. Uh, he was put on trial for supporting the Copernican model, and when he was put on trial afterwards, they threatened him with torture if he didn't confess and swear that he would never do it again, so he did. But he was put under house arrest for the last 11 years of his life, and it was during that time that he did work that really did more to tear down the Ptolemaic model and support the Copernican model than anything else, but it wasn't anything that anyone associated with astronomy. It was his studies of motion, and his studies of motion eventually led to the work of Isaac Newton, and it was with Newton's laws of motion and gravitation that the Ptolemaic model was finally put to rest. He made a lot of contributions to astronomy and physics. We'll talk about some of those. Improvements to the telescope. Galileo did not invent the telescope. It was invented by a Flemish optician, I'm guessing he be, would have been called. He wasn't using it for astronomy, and, but he actually patented it. Hans Lippersche, I think that's how you pronounce his name, invented it, although there were some squabbles. When Galileo first heard about the telescope, it was about a three-power telescope, which means it only magnified things three times. And he started making his own, and shortly was up to an 18-power telescope, and eventually within, oh, a matter of just a few years, had built 30 power telescopes. And with the 30 power telescope, you can actually see quite a bit. I've got a 30 power telescope I made, and I can see cloud bands on Jupiter. I can see the rings of Saturn and things like that with it. It's a better 30 power telescope than Galileo's was. I didn't make the lenses. Something else Galileo did, he wrote about astronomy in a language other than Latin which was unusual at the time. And he made observations of lunar craters and mountains and sunspots. This was considered somewhat heretical at the time because things in the heavens were supposed to be perfect. And where he saw craters and lumps of stuff on the moon and then the dark spots on the sun, people didn't believe that those could have been there. He also saw Jupiter's moons. One of the arguments against the Copernican model had been that if the Earth is orbiting the Sun, we would leave the moon behind. But Galileo looked out into space and he saw Jupiter and he saw four moons orbiting it, which by the way you can see through a pair of inexpensive binoculars. He saw these four moons orbiting Jupiter, and they moved through space with Jupiter. So if that could, if Jupiter could have its moon stay with it, then why couldn't the Earth have its moon stay with it? This was pre-gravity. There was no concept of gravity at the time. He also observed a full set of phases for Venus. 
this turns out to be important regarding the Copernican model. And I'll show you here. This is Venus. Um, let's see, Earth is here in the center. This would be the Sun. And in the Ptolemaic model, Venus orbited the Earth, but its epicycle was surrounding a point that was in between Earth and the Sun. And so that's the way it was. And in that model, if you had been able to look at Venus through a telescope, now this was developed long hundreds and, well, actually more than a thousand years before the invention of the telescope. Nobody would have speculated on this, but here are the phases that you would see right up here for Venus. Something you might notice is that you never see more than a crescent Venus here. Also, there's a huge variation in the size of Venus depending on where it is with regards to the Earth. But still, sometimes you'll see a crescent Venus illuminated on the right side then it changes to a crescent Venus illuminated on the left side, but never more than a crescent. You never even get to a full half Venus. And so that was according to the Ptolemaic model. But Galileo saw a full set of phases for Venus. And so let's see how that could possibly happen. Okay, already with this particular alignment between the Earth and Venus, we're seeing a gibbous Venus here. A nearly full Venus here. An even more full Venus here. And then Venus begins to shrink. And again, just about a half Venus there. Okay, that's something you would never see in the Ptolemaic model. But Galileo saw these things through his telescope. So those were things that were different. So automatically with those observations of Venus that Galileo made through his telescope, that's convincing evidence that there's something severely wrong with the Ptolemaic model and that the Copernicus the model of Copernicus, the Copernican model, is more accurate. So that was something that happened. Here are some pictures, photographs that were taken in 2004. Uh, they're not the greatest things, but uh, you can see here a little bit of a gibbous Venus here. And then, uh, let's see. Oh, let's see, I guess we're listing the day of the month first here, and then the month, and then the year. So, um, February 27th to March 17th to March 22nd to March 27th, and then April 3rd, and so forth through here. And interesting thing about the size of Venus it varies hugely. It would have been probably over on the far side of the sun for this first picture. And you get over to here, and it's much nearer the Earth. And if you actually calculated the area of this part of the planet that's illuminated or reflecting light toward Earth at this time, this area would be larger than the area here. And it's when it's a crescent 
that Venus happens to be at its brightest for our eyes. And you can look at it through a telescope and see that. It's kind of neat to see. Uh, if you like reading about history, there are some good books about this history. Uh, one, Galileo's Daughter by Davis Sobel, that just came out, oh, maybe 15 years ago or so. And she was the first person who ever translated the letters of Galileo's oldest daughter into English. They'd always been left in Italian or whatever it was they wrote in, probably Italian. And then Letters to My Father is mostly just the letters. The Galileo's Daughter is a good biography of Galileo as well as having um, partial segments of the letters in it. But those are both uh, easily read books, not terribly technical. And it, interesting about that time, The Sleepwalkers is a book by Arthur Kessler uh, that was written, oh, sometime in the 1940s, I think, maybe a little earlier than that. But it's a, a pretty good historical book, although it isn't always exactly correct. Uh, Kessler used the phrase, the book nobody read to describe Copernicus's book. And uh, the next author on here, Owen Gingrich, wondered about that and actually tracked down the great Copernicus chases, his attempts to track down every first and second printing copy of the book that's still in existence. And he found many of them, hundreds. But... Uh, Something he noticed in those books was that the owners of the book would go to great detail taking notes in the margins and doing calculations, matching Copernicus's calculations, sometimes finding an error or two here and there, but mostly just working along with Copernicus's math. And it was definitely read and definitely read carefully by a lot of people. Um, in some of the passages in the book, Gingrich will describe how excited he was when he's looking at a book and he recognizes the handwriting and realizes that he's looking at someone like Kepler's copy or something like that. So, interesting book for the history buffs of you. Okay, that's it for now.